Do you realize that each time you uh, put something in the plate, you're investing in somebody's life halfway around the world? You know that. I mean, there are orphans in uh, Uganda that we help with every new member that comes to this church. Just a visitor. Um, there are people, literally, while well, you know what's going on in the Philippines, but that's going around all over the world. That's exciting. I got a trivia question for you. All right, Bible thinking caps. Jesus told a story about a rich man and Lazarus. Do you remember that story? What was the point of that story? Why did he give it? Now, it wasn't a parable. He actually said there was a man by the name of Lazarus. You remember the story, right? Well, yeah, it was definitely a warning. <clears throat> There's a lot of things you can get out of it. Obviously, the fact that the rich man is told that it's time for Lazarus to get his, right? He's sitting there at a banqueting table leaning against the breast of Abraham, his father. But the purpose of that message, he had just finished saying that one jot nor one tittle of the law would ever fail. And remember what he told Lazarus? Lazarus said, or um, I'm sorry, the rich man. The rich man said, I have five brothers. I don't want them to come here. Can you send Lazarus back from the dead? And Abraham's response was, well, they have Moses in the law. Let him read it. Oh, no, no, they'll believe if, if, if Lazarus comes back from the dead, they'll believe. No, no, they won't. <laughs> he said, if they won't believe the word of God, then it doesn't matter if someone comes back from the dead. That's the point. The point was that Jesus was saying, God has confirmed his word, and he needs not to confirm it again. That record is solid, and therefore we need to take it to heart because not one letter from his word will fail. That's the point of that message. Well, we're in Psalm 28, and Psalm 28 is actually a corollary to that truth. It's a story of David, a psalm written by him, and the historical context is the conflict with his son Absalom. How many people know the story of Absalom and Tamar? Pretty sordid story, isn't it? You know, we have the picture of all of these people, like King David, and we get to see him in all his glory. <laughs> that means we know about Bathsheba. We know about Tamar. We know about his failings as well as anything else. And the story of Absalom is not exactly a good story in the Bible. <clears throat> but nonetheless, the story goes like this. Absalom was the son of David through one of his foreign wives. Actually, from Ashur. Now, that was another kingdom. And so, the boy, Absalom which means father of peace. And he is a, an anti antithesis of Solomon. And he had royal blood through both his mother and his father. And he was a very handsome man. In fact, it says he was the most handsome man in all of Israel. So much so that from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was not one blemish in him. Nice hair. In fact, that's the next verse. It says that he didn't cut his hair but once a year. And he did this as a sign of his masculinity. He would let his hair grow to the point where according to 
um, Josephus, the his, Jewish historian, once a year when he'd cut his hair, his hair would weigh about five pounds. You know how much hair that would be? So he would keep his hair rolled up in a turban, and when he felt like showing off, he would let it flow out. But he was, this man was literally full of himself. He strutted around. Now, he had a sister named Tamar. And Tamar, um, one of his half-brothers, another son of David, fell in love with her and ended up raping her, being forced her to marry him, and then despised her. More than he ever loved her, he despised her. And shamed her, and she ended up... um, Barren and, and considered a widow, and the, although she had never actually married. And it was an ugly, sordid thing. And David did not step up to the plate to deal with the atrocities of Amnon, his son. And so Absalom took it upon himself to deal with it. Absalom, through treachery, killed his half-brother. Not himself, he had his servants do it, of course, but they had, he had it done in public as a defiance to David. And then he fled back to his mommy's house and uh, stayed there in Asher for a while and waited till things blew over. And David finally, uh, at the uh, insistence of Joab, let him come back, although he could live in Jerusalem, but David would not see him for another two years. And he manipulated Joab and this other woman to convince and use the compassion of David's heart to get back into favor. And then he strategically began to take the kingdom from David. He was a very handsome man, and so he had 50 runners go before him, announcing his name whenever he drove this elaborate chariot through town. Oh, he was it. He was all that. He was Brad Pitt. He was something. All the women would swoon, and, and he would just sit there and beam. And he won the hearts. All this pomp and circumstance, he won the hearts of the people against his father David. And he would speak evil of him whenever he could. So that's the story of the psalm, and I'm going to read it. If you have a Bible, read along with me. This is Psalm 28. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, do not be deaf to me. For if you are silent to me, I will become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you for help. When I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. Do not drag me away along with the wicked. And with those who work iniquity, who speak peace with their neighbors, while evil is in their hearts. Requite them according to their work, according to the evil of their practices. Requite them according to the deeds of their hands. Repay them their recompense. Because they do not recognize the works of the Lord, nor the deeds of his hands. He will tear them down and not build them up. Blessed be the name of Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exalts, and with my song, I shall thank him. The Lord is their strength, and he is a saving defense to his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. Now, at first glance, it sounds like David's in trouble. He cries out, and God hears him. And then it seems that he says, oh, God, sock it to my enemy. Now, that's really not what the psalm is saying at all. You'll notice that the first thing he says is, please, God, don't be silent to me. Ever feel that way? Ever feel where God is, you know, not listening? The two phrases he uses, and he connects them, 
are, are basically an expression of God ignoring him. Now, David knows that he has sin. He's got skin in this game. Absalom was right in despising his father for not dealing with the issue of Tamar. But it was a thorny situation, and, and David did not step up to the plate. I'm sure you've been in similar situations, especially when it's family. And you know that someone is going to be offended. No matter which way you turn, it's going to get ugly. Well, that's what David was faced with, but he was king. He didn't have the option not to. And so instead of being the leader that he needed to be, he uh, compromised. He ignored. And so he's pleading with God, God, please don't ignore me. Don't, don't turn a deaf ear to me. And um, he knows that God has the right to. Maybe you've been there. And so he says, God, if you'll ignore me, then I will become like one who goes down to the pit. Now that's a term that you'll see used often especially in the Psalms. And it's not an easy one to track down. You don't find it in the dictionary. But it refers to an ignoble death. It's usually referred to people who die in battle and are thrown into a a pit. Yeah. And he says, please, don't, don't couple me with them. They die by the sword because they live by the sword. That's not me. And he says, I don't don't want to be counted that way. He says, if you're silent, then I will become like those who go down to the pit. Now, he's referring to the fact that he knows that Absalom has won the hearts of the people. David abandoned Jerusalem without a fight. He let Absalom just come in and become king. And um, he knew that his name would be nothing if Absalom were to win. But there's something else in the mix, and we'll get to that. He says, hear the voice of my supplication when I cry to you for help, when I lift my hands toward your holy sanctuary. Now, Some of your Bibles might say holy oracle. That word is only used just three, four times in the entire Bible, and it refers to the holy of holies in the temple, and it's debated among scholars of why. Um, Kyle DeLeese says that it just, it's, it's actually not a Hebrew word, that there's the confusion it should be. It's really an Aramaic word that simply means behind. And he's referring to the back part of the temple, the Holy of Holies. Then you have others that say, no, it's the word dabir, okay? Um, it's, it, DBR in Hebrew is a, uh, those three consonants mean order. And uh, like, for example, Deborah. Well, Deborah means bee. Well, bees are very orderly. <laughs> they do everything. In fact, even their, their hives are done in a, Pentagram, you know, it's kind of, or hexagram, whatever it is. Um, but they're, they're orderly. And the word debar means word, where sounds are put together in order to have meaning. And so this word is taken to mean oracle. It's where God speaks. And there are plenty of times in the Old Testament where the priest would go before God, uh, sometimes with the Urim and Thummim, and receive a word from him. And that's probably what he's referring to. But notice, he's playing this game between ignoring him, turning a deaf ear to him, and so he pleads to the place where God speaks. And he's saying, please, Lord, I lift my hands toward your holy sanctuary. And he's asking for forgiveness. He's asking for mercy. 
But there's more at stake. Because he said, don't drag me away with the wicked, with those who work iniquity. Those people who play games. They're, they're sweet to your face and then they have a dagger in their hand. And he's referring, of course, to Absalom. Absalom used treachery on a regular basis. How he killed his brother, for one. And how he stole the kingdom from David, another. But there's quite a number of other ones. Oh, the way he manipulated David to even get back into his graces is, is just, I mean, a politician would just go, wow. And this guy was a politician, believe me. And he's saying, don't, don't make this a political game, God, between me and Absalom. And who's got the right forces and the right people in the right places, and that's who's going to win. Because that's not really what this is about. Solomon became king, not Absalom. Why? Because God chose it. And God chose every king. In fact, when we get to the book of Daniel, Daniel tells the greatest king of all time, according to Daniel himself, he said, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. Remember? The next kingdom is inferior to you. The greatest king, what did God tell him? He said, God raises up the basis of men. Nebuchadnezzar, you didn't earn the kingdom. God gave you the kingdom. For whatever reasons he chose to use you, he chose to use you. It had nothing to do with you being such a great guy. Because frankly, he wasn't. And so David knew this. That is the one piece in this recipe that changes the whole meaning of the psalm. And it changes the meaning in our lives as we look at our lives. When you don't get that promotion that you were hoping for. When... Um, things don't work out with the family, when whatever. God is in control. If the guy you voted for doesn't get into office, you know what? There's nothing to worry about. God is in control. And so David says, please, Lord, don't let me be carried away along with the wicked. I'm different. I don't fall into that category. And he says this. He keeps saying, requite them. Now, that's an old word. We don't use that all that much. But it means to give an appropriate return. It isn't just justice. It's more. You ever notice that God is not just just. He does it with flair. Haman didn't just die. He died upon the gallows that he built to kill the man of God. Right? The wicked, they shall fall into their own pit. The pit that they set for you, they'll fall in. And that's another term that's used here. He says, I will become like one who goes down to the pit. Now, you remember the story of Jeremiah. When he told them not to go to Egypt, and they went to Egypt, what did they do to him? Remember? They threw him into a pit. And what they threw him in was a dead well. And these were common. A well would dry out. So you'd have this big tube, <laughs> this empty hole in the ground, and at the bottom was muck. And you hear the phrase, he pulled me out of the miry clay. Well, that's what they're referring to. If you go back and you read Jeremiah, you'll find out that Jeremiah got stuck in the miry clay in that bottom of that dry well. And they would use it like they did with the story of Joseph. They would use these pits to throw their enemies in as a means of capture. 
And so it was the picture, not just of a pit, but it was an entrapment. One who is trapped by his enemy and destroyed. And the condition of the body in death being ignoble was a way to disgrace them altogether. And as you read all the passages that refer to this term, you'll see that it also spills over to the afterlife, and it implies that it's a section of Sheol for those who are shamed in death. And so David pleads to requite them. Give them what they deserve, God. And he gives a reason. He says, because they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the deeds of his hands. Now, what he's referring to is not the idea of just disbelief. He's talking about the fact that Absalom knew farewell that God anointed David king. And that there was history behind all of that. That Samuel, one of the greatest prophets of the nation, was the one who went and sought him out and anointed him when he was a young man. And that Saul defied God's ordained order And David had to flee. You remember the whole story. And so what he's saying here is, God, they don't regard your choices. They don't regard the things that you have done and proven to be your will. Just like what Jesus was saying regarding the Scripture, David is saying, but he's broadening it beyond the Scripture into experience. He's saying that they do not recognize the works of your hands. The deeds that you have accomplished, such as raising David up. Now, did God declare to David that there would be a dynasty? That God would choose a succession of kings from David? Culminating in the Messiah himself? Yes, he did. 2 Samuel 7, you can read about it. But the point is that Absalom didn't see that. Through treachery, he was going to reach out and take what he felt was his, regardless of what God has said, regardless of what Samuel did to anoint David king. He didn't need anyone to anoint him. He anointed himself. You see my point? This is the providence of God. God has declared what he is about to do. And then he sets about doing it. And man can make whatever choices he wants to make, but he will not frustrate the will of God. And David, of all people, knew that. Notice what he says as he reads down. He says, God will tear them down and not build them up. It doesn't matter what they attempt to build unless the Lord builds the house Those who labor do so what? In vain. What does that mean? In vain. Without purpose, it means empty. For nothing. You will not get one penny back out of your investment. It's nothing. Vanity. Emptiness. And that's what he's saying. And so he's making these statements in faith because he knows eventually he's going to have to face Absalom. And God allowed Absalom, if you know the story, to believe a lie because the lie played in to Absalom's vanity regarding himself. Isn't that always the way it works? The wicked shall fall by their own trap. You see, Absalom was full of himself. All you had to do is tell him how wonderful he was. (laughs) Now you've got his attention. One of David's key men went off and joined Absalom in his rebellion. 
And he told him what to do. He says, you need to strike now before David has a chance to get his armies together. Do it now and you'll kill him and he's out of the way. But unbeknownst to Absalom, David had a spy in the midst, another counselor. He said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. You know, you want to make David suffer. You want to do this. You want to do... And so Absalom listened to him. Had he not listened to him, Absalom would have won the battle. But you see, God knew Absalom's weakness. Absalom's weakness was Absalom. You want to know your weakness? Look in the mirror. You'll find it. And so he says this, God will tear them down and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exalts, and with my song, I shall thank him. And he makes this statement. The Lord is their strength. Who is he referring to? The nation of Israel. And he says, and he is the saving defense to his anointed. He's referring to himself. But he doesn't refer to himself as me. He refers to himself as his anointed. That was the error that Absalom fell into. He rejected the counsel of God. God had chosen his man, and Absalom wasn't content with God's choice. He wanted his own. We've all been guilty of that, haven't we? God, I want you to do it this way. No, I'm doing it that way. And we can get, you know, sit in the corner and pout and get all offended. But God says, no, I have a perfect plan. And I defend my anointed. And so he says, save your people, Lord. Bless your inheritance. God had made this choice. David didn't make it. And David wasn't the anointed because he was some special guy. It was his lack of speciality. We know all his sins, and there are many. David wasn't allowed to build the temple because he was a man of bloody hands, a man of war. And then he says, be their shepherd also, and I love this, and carry them forever. Now, in this psalm, we see a number of points. Number one, God keeps his word to his people. And those who defy his will will find themselves without remedy. That's the first thing you learn from it. Absalom needed to learn that truth. The second is that when you cry out to God in your need, guess what? God answers. There's only one exception to that, in all of the history of man. You can find the exception in Psalm 22. Let me read it for you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words, far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned among the, upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out, and they were delivered. In you they trusted, and they were never disappointed. But I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. There's only one time in history where God didn't answer prayer. And it was the prayer of a righteous man. And it was a prayer on that cross. It's the only time God has ever turned his back on anyone. David, in his fear, says, Oh, Lord, please don't abandon me. I know you won't be promised, but please. He was scared. We've been there. But I guarantee you, it may not work out the way you expect it to. But 
God will never, ever abandon his people. He never turns a deaf ear. He may deal with things in your life. He may make it hard for you. But he never abandons you. And the last statement I want to make is this. David could have looked at his mistakes and said, well, chicken have come home to roost. It's my fault. I should have dealt with it. I didn't do it right. I made mistakes. Absalom was right in, in being angry about what happened with his sister. He could have wallowed in self-pity for a while. He could have looked at it through human eyes. Said, well, it's him against me. Better man win. But he didn't. He saw that God was confirming his promise to carry out all the way to the day that Jesus Christ was born. The king upon his father's throne, David. And he knew that. That there was a legacy that God had promised. And those who disregard that promise don't have a right to that inheritance. And that God protects his inheritance and his people. He shepherds his people. And that's what he says. Save your people. Bless your inheritance. And then he adds this last phrase. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Now, David is actually referring back to a statement that Moses made. He's referring back to a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 1 where Moses is talking to the children of those who traveled those 40 years in the wilderness. Everyone from the age of 20 on up, except for Joshua and Caleb, are dead. He's talking to a generation of people that were young, children, or born during that 40-year march. And he makes this statement. He says, The Lord your God, who goes before you, will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son, in all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. But as for all this, you did not trust the Lord your God who goes before you on your way. What a picture. When they followed that pillar of cloud by day into a den of vipers, poisonous snakes, God led them there. Wow. Like a father carries his son upon his shoulders. Of course, he had a purpose in that, didn't he? When they followed that pillar of cloud to some water, and when they went to drink it, they found it poisonous. God led them there. We could go on and on, couldn't we? God says, you know, I was carrying you like a father carries his son, pointing out all the difficulties of life, trying to teach you what it is to know right from wrong and to learn to trust me. But you never did. And so David had learned that lesson. David knew that God's plan was perfect and that despite Absalom's designs, it would be carried out. The providence of God would make sure that David was successful and Absalom was not. Because Absalom didn't trust in the landmarks that God had laid down for truth when he proved himself faithful over and over and over again. And so the lesson we take away from this is that not only do we know that God never turns his back on his children, but we also know that all of the difficulties in life that we face have purpose and no tears ever falls from our eyes without God marking it down. 
And last but not least, God has established landmarks along the way for our faith to hang on to. We can look back and we can see that God has proven himself and established himself in his word all along so that the future, even though we don't see it, even though we know it holds for us some boating, there is hope in the purpose of God in that matter. What a psalm. Psalm 28. Psalm of David. Would you pray with me?